Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Women of Words 23rd Annual Reading. Oh my gosh, I know. From when we first started our performances in 1997, our programs were made up of our most complete pieces of poetry and prose. And then in 2008, we began to use themes that would often generate new work for us. However, this year we tried that, and it didn't really work out that well. And part of it had to do with um, trying to get together during the winter months, right? Remember the winter that we all had? Oh my gosh, every Monday was a snow day. Um, so we found that our writing was taking off in different directions. So this is kind of a mix and amalgamum of new work. Um, tonight we're sharing, as I said, new work as well as old work that's been revisited and revised each of us showcasing our own voice, thus the uh, name of the program, Four Voices. So thank you so much for being here. Apparently I'm the lead off, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, my first poem is um, kind of a, I don't know if I would call it an oxymoron. Um, it's more of an opposite. So the title is The End of Beauty Excites Me. The end of beauty excites me. It is the ever-present possibility of sunset destruction. Loss of clouds peaked in an orange-gray, and a great blue heron etching his silhouette as a black curved line through the air. The silence of crickets beneath October's leaves. The end of beauty excites me. It is the ever-present possibility of highways becoming uncoiled. The sweet smell of hay gone tawny yellow beside the Holsteins. No milking today. No 18-wheelers shining their chrome fenders, racing city speed limits. The end of beauty excites me. It is the ever-present possibility of the draft of laundry hanging out of window sills, panes of glass coated in a fine soot over tenement fire escapes, flashing red, red geraniums in clay pots. Uh, the next poem, one of the context things you need to know about is um, when my older son was a pitcher at Plymouth Regional High School and for Babe Ruth and American League, the term for practicing how they worked their throw was to shoot the ball to the bucket, and the bucket was literally a bucket at their right or left side, depending on whether they were right or left-handed. And um, it was to help the follow through. So my son was right-handed, so the bucket would be at his left. And um, at the time, I was a fairly avid photographer, not only of sports, but of other things as well. This is called Snapshot. Shoot the ball in a curve to the bucket. Inhale, hold. Exhale at the same time the shutter clicks and your hand clicks off the ball, releasing the stitches, leaving your fingers and thumb imprinted on white leather, and my finger touches and retouches the button that releases the film as you give up the ball to what air will do with it between mound and plate. The batter's arms draw in then out, extend bone and wood from the pivot of his body, turn of his feet, pull of his hips, eyes somewhere else, not on the curve of white dropping just before the catcher's feet. The umpire watches as intently as I do. His breath held in erupts loudly when his arm goes up, hand a tight fist, you already know the strike. I wait to exhale, frame the stretch your body makes, wait to push the button to let light and lens and film do what they will 
with your momentary pose. So in speaking about my sons, um, they had the advantage or disadvantage of ending up in the um, Chevy Lumina APV van as we were driving around to all of our activities. And I would often be inspired to pull over to the side of the road and write a poem or draft one. Um, and they were patient. <laughs> they were patient. Coming of age. Summer haircuts at Aunt Jean's, a green kitchen stool, a towel, barber clippers. We boys huddled in the living room, whistled out of the neighborhood, our hair wetted down from the garden hose. She points to me, my first. Under the amber glow of the porch's bug light, Aunt Jean drapes the towel across my shoulders. I tremble. A press of her palm bends my head. The first hair falls. I slant my eyes left, try to measure the inches, sheared in each clipper pass, collecting on my shoulder and lap. Then I look toward the house. Faces press against the windows of the porch. Eyes wide. They watch the fleecing of my childhood. My next one again has something to do with um, photography and hunting. So we'll see how that comes up. Shooting a mallard. The November dawn sifts smells of marsh and water and fog, splashes the duck blind in black and gray and silver. There, a mallard glides down sunlit aisles of color pouring onto the sky, announces his flock with a pulsing whistle of wings. Etched again tawny light, trickling through grasses, a hunter stalks quick silver waves. His weapon flashes. The camera bursts with a click. And my last one is for all of you maple sugarer gatherers out there, right? We just finished that season. Annual visit. Beyond my stone wall, footsteps crunch lightly in February's snow. I pause. Here they are yours as you lay the sap lines. Then watch them sink into the sugar bush to sleep until the end of the spring run when red buds leaf out. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. This, this is so gratifying. You know, we, we spend the winter and we're just writing, writing, not writing, not writing, writing, not writing. And um, we have no idea what we're going to create or if anyone will come to listen. So thank you so much for completing our art by being here. Um, I'm a Plymouth native, believe it or not. Um, so there's a lot of local, localness in my work. Um, so dish soap foam. Bright morning fills my kitchen. Yesterday's dishes fill the sink. In goes the stopper. I turn the tap, release a stream, a cascade, a double squirt sends dish soap into the sink, ignites little eruptions of noise and light. I swish my hand, small bubble boundaries, bounce, rise, catch the light, rainbows, crackle, collapse. I swish again, waves of sun-seasoned blue-green abundance swell, rotate, 
swirl. I shut the faucet to save the floor, bend to grab a dish rag, bury my nose deep in a multi-bubble extravaganza. I sneeze, laugh, lean back, forget the dishes and swish, swish away the day. I don't like housework. <laughs> I'd rather play. Anyways, the rag end of winter. My grandmother had wonderful ways of talking about things, and it was the rag end of winter. So, First it's gales blowing sleet, wind to shake the shutters off, snow piles filthy with mud and stones, shaggy with unraked leaves. Lichen-covered branches litter streets and lawn. Way too early for silver soft willow buds. I watch where maple trunks meet snow. Dimples become deep, deeper depressions. Sap rises, pulls its warm along. I long for flurries to become showers. Showers to melt the back step gardens release snowdrops and crocus. The sap should be running now. Sun brightened days with cool nights for boiling. Nights sweet with curls of maple cuddled smoke. The street's rotten shoulder snow continues to dribble streams sufficient to carry off bottles and cans. It's the rag end of winter, once the jagged ice jams break free, wash across puckerbrush fields and um, forgotten trucks. Then drive slow. After you pass the wood plant, the south-facing cellar walls and fences sport rich, rich fists of daffodils a farm family's affordable treasure. Finally, it's the rag end of winter. The big storm's <clears throat> mostly over. I'll make pancakes for breakfast. Drown them in the Rumney Farm syrup. It's the rag end of winter. I'm ready for spring. It's hard sometimes to get people to understand the process of poetry. This poem won't explain it. This, <laughs> this edge of this poem, congruent like hands pressed palm to palm. If thumb and fingers grab and pull, the scrape of the bamboo rake releases the dry aroma of winter-aged leaves. This poem renders work of thought and scattered fragments congruent. You have to know this poem started out two pages long. Okay. Spring storm. All in good order it begins. Distant thunder, like the rap of a conductor's baton. Lightning pirouettes in and out of steel gray clouds. Winds rise and fits and starts. Prowl, pause, then twist around themselves. Leaves of maples turn their silvered backs, as if in applause. Plumes of oak shake leaf cacophonies. Spindle elms bend and wag. Now begins the asymmetric pit, pit, pat of water drops on asphalt. Flash after flash rips clouds and sky. Faster and faster drums. The rain louder and louder and stronger thunder crashes. Swollen streams sweep leaf litter 
twigs and trash before their quickening rush. Through the night, the weather, like a diva, rages. <laughs> By dawn, the town's awash. Red and blue lights mark flooded roads. Emergency sirens wail and fallen signs block doors. The wind shifts directions, closes down. One final clap of thunder echoes and fades. Clouds part, reveal patches of light. Rain slows, softens, stops. One by one, the turkey vultures rouse, shake away the wet, push off on the hunt for breakfast. Oblivious to the human drama around them, the rest of the feathered audience shrugs and begins their own rescheduled dawn performance. Usually I have two or three turkey vulture poems. So. <laughs> Only, uh, you know, a guest appearance here. <sighs> Neither safe nor easy. Warning. I don't control the stream of my unconscious. Strong images in vivid color rise from somewhere mysterious inside me. Dreams, visions wake themselves, lift the latch, escape into lonely places, drag the wakened me to a road lit only by stars and a hunter's moon. I'd prefer to play it safe, swim to the center of the pond, stride the marsh's edge, stay in the woods. Unlike the adolescent moose who stepped into an ongoing car, I see mangled hindquarters blanketed by blood, his unbroken front legs splayed at angles across the dented roof and hood. Surrounded by silence, Filled with silence, eyes opened wide, ears straight, fixed forward. The racked head moved slowly from side to side, over and over, not yet aware, not yet closed down, not yet disconnected from life or the ripening spread of death. Thank you. Hi, I'm Suzanne. And tonight I offer a bouquet of poems that I've picked just for you. <laughs> I've always loved flowers and woods and wild things. Growing up in Minnesota as a kid, I played out in the woods all the time. And now that I'm retired, my husband and I drove from Virginia up to another northern woods here in New Hampshire. And I still like to play out in the woods whenever I can. <laughs> so that hasn't changed. Um, we live halfway up Bear Mountain, and our closest neighbors are trees. And we've lived here for nine years now, and I think I'm almost becoming part of them. The trees, that is. My voice comes from these woods. First poem is Awakening and... Since I'm getting old, I need glasses. <laughs> Awakening. My furrowed bark grown thick with winter, worn coat over worn coat, heavy, grayed, lichen furred, 
I clutch it tight around my core, shut out the cold. Want to sleep. But roots, restless in the night, keep stirring. Burrow underground into silt pockets, buried sand and clay, glacial till, drill down through darkness. Deep fractures, the groans of shifting earth, feel around each rock, deeper still beyond the freeze. A poem, coiled in my veins, thrumming, thrumming, snow melt, thaw, a mud smell. I hear the soil breathe, loosen its knot, sweet spring urging through roots, through heart, through limbs, bare branches, soft with sleep, stretch, feather the sky. A charm of finches glitter in my arms, their bird song wavering like their flight. Yes, it was a long winter, <laughs> and we finally arrived at spring, I think. <laughs> Um, my husband and I go for walks every afternoon, and it's kind of like a treasure hunt, looking to see what's new in the woods. One of my favorites, and one of the earliest in the spring, is the bloodroot. Pale, leathery leaf, lobed like the palm of my hand, clasps a slender stem, artery red, with single white flower. The first each spring to push through snow and the fetid forest duff behind my house. My mother always knew where to find them in her Minnesota woods. I remember her kneeling, uncovering, pushing back leaf litter. To show me its secret, she picked the flower. Red sap bled in her hand. Was it dead? What I couldn't see then. The rhizome buried beneath the earth, branching out, connecting one to another, living still. The next spring, the next, even now, in these woods, years after my mother's death, the bloodroot will bloom again and bleed. But it's not just the bloodroot that pokes through. There are lots of other treasures in the springtime. Here's my ode to May, New Hampshire style. It's titled, Out of the Muck. <laughs> A rotting, earthen smell. Rainwater, seepage, mud. A wet mat woven of dead leaves, hollow stems, stubble, the brittle fronds of last year's ferns. But pale green fingertips poke through this fetid heap. Wild lilies waiting to scribble their dreams. And fiddleheads, silver green question marks on curl, exclaim. Blood red stems worm upwards, holding tight buds, fetal knots. Colt's foot kicks open, bolts yellow across the field. We've all been here crouching in the dark, a part of earth and rot, compost teeming with life, poised to crown, spring into a new world and cry out our name.
In Virginia, the redbud trees grow wild at the edges of the forest, and they're one of the first to bloom in the springtime, and they're just beautiful. What's unusual about them is that the blossom appears first, just right on the stems of the trees, and then it's not until later that the leaves appear. Last spring, when Jim and I were in Vermont, um, we saw a redbud tree in bloom, and it was the first that I'd seen up here. It was very special. It reminded me of those Virginia Springs. Redbud. Flamingo beaked buds open on bare branches. Pollen drunk the long-tongued bees mount bright blossoms. Startled, petals burst pink against a blue sky. Only after the gaudy show, tender leaves, red-rimmed, unfold, grow into a heart. They're heart-shaped. <laughs> the next poem is a memory embedded in another memory. It takes place in a Minnesota college town. Uh, my husband and I are walking along the Cannon River, which flows right through the center of town. It's called Ephemeron. Tumbling rapids, dam spill. Above the water, clouds of tissue paper wings, frenzied flutter like bedsheets rustling. Dusky flight lit by riverside light, a setting sun. We watch the mayflies rise. A mad rush, they quiver and swirl, fill the air, rising, falling. A memory caught in this half light. We were young, smell of earth, Sweat, aster crushed beneath our bodies, and above, the sky full of milkweed seed. Spent, the mayflies fall into the river, float face down, wings spread open as if flying, still. We live above Newfound Lake in Hebron. I can see it from my bedroom window first thing in the morning and last thing at night. And during the day, I can see it from my living room windows. <laughs> it's beautiful each season, but I think it has a very special quality during the off seasons, the quieter times. This poem was written last fall during one of those quiet times. New found. The lake stretches as far as I can see and more, edged with hills, folding into valleys, forest gold, rusting brown, lake clear of boats, the summer buzz, only shush of wind, leaf shiver, the soft, steady wash of waves. I pull off my boots, wade into cold, wind-riffled water, wave ridges scalloped in sand, stand still. Springs bubble beneath the sand, wash clean, holy water. Once I dreamt I died, pushed off earth, swam into sky, a water creature, reflections of lake, hill, cloud, me streaming through sea sky. Our bodies aren't holy water, but enough to feel a ripple, wave, the seasons change each time I stand still, knee deep in lake, 
I am new found. Hello, I'm Jenny. So who here saw the lunar eclipse last winter? Anybody? Oh, a few brave souls. It was a rough night, wasn't it? Um, but it was pretty amazing. I don't know about you, but it, it impacted me more than, I, I know I've seen other eclipses, but that one just really stuck with me. And you might recall that it was being dubbed a blood wolf supermoon, right? <laughs> And the blood part had to, has to do with the fact that it really does turn some very cool colors during the height of the eclipse. So this is called January Blood Moon. And I'm getting reflection. <laughs> All right. January Blood Moon. Over and over, I shiver by the back door, pulled from the warmth of blankets your arms, to mark the progress of Earth's dark paw across the round, hunched back of this oversized moon. The white shape shrinks until at last I throw on all my layers and stand transfixed in heaped fresh snow, listening to the creak of tree trunks in an Arctic wind, temperature minus two and falling fast while stars bloom across the sky. Before bed, I had called you outside to see how crazy bright the yard lay, snowbound and shining, streaked with moon shadow. Now, night is a noose pulling slowly tighter around the smoky lunar pelt, crescent edge waning as constellations close in. All at once, there is nothing but a weird, dark light. Shadows snuffed. Red boils across the moon's veiled skin. It's not the first time I cannot discern between mortally wounded or finally alive. So this next piece was inspired by a biblical quote, take off your shoes for you stand on hallowed ground. And it actually appears in two different places in the Old Testament, but the most notable is in the chapter where Moses encounters the burning bush. And I was really struck by that line and the idea because taking off your shoes, of course, is a mark of respect but in this particular case, it also has the effect of putting the person in direct physical contact with something powerful. So this all took place before Moses received the Ten Commandments, so I called it the first command. Take off your shoes. And the man, obedient to that flaming voice, dropped one knee to the hard soil and fumbled with his leathers. When at last he stood, knees vibrating and heart choking his throat, face shielded from the blaze that streamed from branch and leaf, yet left no mark, his toes clenched down and gripped the dirt. And the silent earth pushed back, unyielding, so that when the fire called his name, there was no place to hide, nothing to do but stand still, the unbound sky above him, the fire of God before him, and only the pressure of his two feet on the stony ground to save him. I'm going to switch gears to some seasonal poems. So I think it must have been last March that um, things, nothing was really blooming up here to speak of, but I stopped off uh, at a public garden in Massachusetts 
and there was this hillside that was just covered with all different kinds of daffodils. And of course, my first instinct was to just plop belly first on the ground and stick my face in these flowers. Um, but uh, after a couple of minutes, I, I turned my head and I noticed a young woman nearby who was having a somewhat different experience. Mm -hmm. Daffodils. The young woman poised with her back to the daffodils, butter, gold, tangerine flooding the embankment, arranges the drape of her long sundress, dark hair to her waist, while her friend clicks shot after shot on her phone. Face always turned toward the tiny lens, she twists, crouches, reclines among that splendor, oblivious to what the flowers are so ardently saying. Yet there she stands among them, straining on her tender stem, a little more desperate, but no less vivid, leaning hard into the world. So amazingly enough, it was 20 years ago now that I lived in the Bronx for two years during my residency. And it's been long enough that I don't think about New York all that often, but for some reason, just a few weeks ago, New York City came popping into my head out of nowhere. So this is called Midtown April. The birds suddenly remind us they are not our creatures. They enter our streets on brown and blue wings from somewhere else, rouse us with hints of that other life, crumbs tossed at our feet. Through the long, dull winter, weather only made the concrete harder. But now the air has a different agenda. It seeds rebellion through chain link and plate glass, spices the spaces between bricks. Even cement gray skies have a new energy. Rolled macadam, molded steel, tile, mortar, automatic doors and climate control, all that we relied on to stay smooth, constant, now seems less secure. Ants find their way in and strange new smells. Abruptly, we see how full of cracks is the unnatural world. From above and below, dirt and wet assert themselves. Tendrils, seepage, the froth of decay spell out the fate of chrome and concrete. April leaves nothing undisturbed. We skirt its crevices, daring ourselves to look through to see something that could redeem us or unravel us. And finally, a rather different take on spring. That's take, it's set in New Hampshire, or inspired by New Hampshire, even though the title is actually Rome. Rome. Six days of rain, and this craggy Northland is transformed. Rivers washed clean of ice, new glutted and overtaking the fields. Pale petaled bloodroot stars the forest floor. No simple constellation, but a whole milky stream poured down. More blooms than one could ever want or need. The silence of snow has been shouted away by rooster and wood frog, waterfall, bird call, the whole randy chorus. And though for so long I was content to gnaw on winter's dry bone, it seems I'm singing now too. I am honey drunk like the bees that stagger among the blossoms before noon, their pockets bloated with gold. I stuff my belly with new shoots, my arms with garlands, my lungs with fragrance, greedy as a Roman at a feast. I gorge on what I can and leave the rest to rot. 
Frogs clutch each other in the ditch. The wildcat screams with desire and schoolgirls bear their skin. We are careless, reckless. We spill the wine in the dirt and call for more. We all know this orgy will be brief. Soon enough, there'll be hell to pay. We'll be picking bones again. But when in Rome, there's no choice but to live large till the fall. Thank you. Thank you.